Hi everyone, this is Mary Gregory with MAS Coding Solutions. Uh, how are you all today? Uh, today we will be talking about ICD-10-CM coding guidelines. And today we're going to be focusing on how to code syndromes. Now, quite frankly, I think coding syndromes can be challenging. But remember, we have a coding guidelines concerning syndromes. And that guideline you will find under the General Coding Guideline, and it is B as in boy 15. So if you go to your General Coding Guidelines and go to B 15, it will give you some uh, tips or help of what the guideline is concerning syndromes. The first thing they tell you in dealing with syndromes is that you have to, you can actually go to the term syndrome, okay, in your book. Um, so syndrome, it says follow your alphabetical index guidance when coding syndromes. In the absence, so what that means to you is this, you actually go to the term syndrome in your book or on your coding software and you will go alphabetically down the list and you will see if you can find that syndrome listed. What if you cannot find the syndrome listed under syndrome? What are you going to do? Well, it, once again, our coding guidelines tell us what to do. It said, in the absence of your alphabetical index guidance, assign a code for the documented manifestation of the syndrome. What types of signs and symptoms that the patient is having, okay? Now, it also tells us that additional codes for manifestation that are not integral to that syndrome uh, can be coded separate. So let's, let's break this out into uh, this part. Let's say it like this. First, go to your alphabetical index and go to syndrome. There's nothing there. But it's a step that they don't tell you that's in this book. And that step is this. You can actually go to the name of that syndrome. And I'm uh, and it would sometimes the name of the syndrome is listed in the alphabetical index by that name. Uh, and I have an example. So I have an example of what we call Wolf Parkinson. Uh, white syndrome okay when you go to syndrome in your book and you go all the way down to W to Wolf W O F F there is not a listening for that in syndrome so you won't find it there but before you code manifestation and symptoms go to the term Wolf in your book now when you go to the term Wolf in your book it will actually give you your code and your code would be I 45.6 so before you code all manifestation and signs and symptoms of a syndrome you need to look in the alphabetical index under the name of the syndrome because everything will not be listed on the syndrome now, let's say where well, I went to the name of the syndrome and there was nothing there. So it wasn't under syndrome, it wasn't under the eponym. Sometimes we refer it as eponym uh, when a syndrome or condition or procedure has been named after a, a person, place, unfortunately sometimes a thing. Uh, so when you go look that up and it's not there, now you got to think, okay, do, what are my signs and symptoms? What did this patient present with? And this doesn't matter whether the patient present in the outpatient area arena, such as the physician office, observation, or inpatient. Now I got an inpatient, of course, it's a little bit different uh, because I have to follow my inpatient uh, guideline on that, how to select my principal diagnosis. So, but you're going to want to look up the signs and symptoms. I also put, um, uh, a little, another little tip in here that sometimes you have to think about. Before you uh, list all your signs and symptoms, always kind of Google your, because you notice one thing is said in that um, 
guideline is that when you code uh, a syndrome, you we have to know what is integral to that syndrome. So let's say I don't know. Let's. Um, I was trying to think of one I had the other night. It was called a, a recruiters. Uh, it was a recruiters. They used the word recruiters. Post R S. Post recruiting stroke, something like that. Now, there was no code in my book for that or in my coding software. So I said, okay, let me look this up. So I Googled that to see, number one, was there such a thing as recruitance? We know recruitance means something that occurs um, uh, as a late effect of something else. And so I said, well, let me look this up. Well, sure enough, uh, there are some times when a patient may have a stroke, a uh, CVA, a uh, cerebral infarction. And what happens is, after they have had that infarction, sometimes some of the signs and symptoms of that infarction itself will reappear. And they call that a post-recruiting syndrome, something like that. So, uh, I went out, I looked it up, and I had to determine what was that patient recruitance? What was the symptoms that was bringing that patient back in after having a stroke? And in that case, it was a left-sided weakness or a right-sided weakness. And so, of course, I know the guidelines concerning uh, right-sided weakness or left-sided weakness. Do you know the guideline concerning that? Hmm. After a stroke? See, that's very important that you know that. So, according to the coding guidelines, when someone come in with a left-sided weakness or right-sided weakness and they have had a stroke or is having a stroke and there's no other documentation to document where that weakness is coming from or what it's due to, you the coder assume that it's due to the stroke. So, my principal diagnosis in that case, see I couldn't code acute stroke again because the patient didn't have another stroke. But what I hate to code was that patient hemiplegia slash hemoparesis in those case in that case. And so once again, I did my research. You always in coding, there are gonna be times you're gonna to have to do a little research to see what's going on uh, with that. And also, if that patient was aphasia uh, due to that history of stroke, I can code my aphasia. But see, the aphasia didn't bring the patient in. The aphasia did not cause the patient to seek a treatment. Uh, it was the, the left side of weakness that caused that. I won't go into all the signs and symptoms, but that's really what she presented with. That's what they worked up. And that's what they determined that the patient had. So, be prepared to go out and research things. And see, this is going to be really important when you have a, a syndrome that you're not familiar with and the physician is describing the signs and symptoms that goes with that, now as a coder we'll have to go out and look to see what's integral. And, and when I don't have guidance from um, the coding clinic or some type of uh, trusted information site, you know, maybe I'll go to uh, the National Library of Congress or something like that. I may go to a uh, Mayo Clinic site uh, but I'm going to go to a reputable site and um, try to find out what's integral. If those signs and uh, symptoms are not integral to that condition, then of course you can coat them separately. And you have to be aware of that. I think there's been time in my life that I probably have coated life uh, that I have probably um, overcoated uh, a syndrome. Uh, when it was just signs and symptoms and we didn't have a code for it. Um, and there's probably been some time I undercoded it, meaning I should have had more codes. And all I'm saying is this, so you can understand, no matter how great you are as a coder, there may be times you're going to miss something. Don't beat yourself up about it. Just learn from it and, and carry on with that. Uh, let's see, I believe that's all I want to talk with you today about syndromes. But I do want to do a FQA here, Frequently Asked Question. And the reason why this is important is because I've gotten this question twice uh, lately. And it has to deal with uh, courses or programs that you all may be enrolling in. 
Um, and the main thing is this, when you enroll in a course, you need to ask that program director exactly how this course will help you to become a, a, a coder. Because when you send me a question like that, I don't know what's in the course. See, and I found out from one girl, she wanted to be a coder, and they didn't even use a code book in that course. How are you going to be a coder when you don't even use a code book? Now, they did give her probably just enough to know uh, if she got a job as a, a office assistant or something, to know how to look a code up. But they wasn't giving her enough to really go out and get a coding certification. So you got to be careful of that. You need to ask the question, how much coding I'm going to get with ICD-10 if you're doing outpatient with CPT? You see, you need to get, several, you need to get more than an hour or two if you want to get somebody's certification. Well, that's about all we have time for today. I want to thank you all for listening to uh, the video today and continue to follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. And I discovered I do have an Instagram account, but I'm going to have to clean it up. There's some people on there that I don't want on there. I know that probably sounds crazy, but my site is a professional site. It is not a site for people to show their bodies and uh, try to catch a boyfriend or girlfriend. I, I mean, I don't know. But my site is a professional site. It is a site for you to come and learn about coding. Because I thought about something today. And I'm going to start using this. I want to teach you how to be a coder and not just a test taker. Look forward to talking to you soon.